So the first thing to do today is kind of a theoretical problem. It's a, it's a proof. We're going to make some assumptions. We're going to assume we've got two functions, say f and g, that are related in a certain way. Assume f prime of x equals g of x and g prime of x equals negative f of x for all values of x. And let's also assume f of zero equals zero and g of zero equals one. Some kind of strange assumptions here. There is a point to this. What do we want to show? We want to show somewhat mysteriously that if you square each function and add the results, that you always get one for all x. That's what we want to show. I see you smiling. Do you know what the functions these are? What functions are they? Sine. They're sine and cosine. Okay. Well, okay. The, the, the cat's out of the bag. They are sine and cosine here. F prime of X equaling G of X is like the fact that the derivative of sine equals cosine. G prime of X equals negative F of X is like saying the derivative of cosine is negative sine of X. Yes, sine of zero is zero and cosine of zero is one. And yes, cos squared or sine squared plus cos squared equals one. But I can prove this without reference to sine and cosine. But it takes a bit of creativity. How do you prove this without using properties of sine and cosine? The key first thing to realize is, you know, one is a constant. And hey, we have something called the constant function theorem that says if the derivative of a nice function is always zero, then the function is constant on whatever interval that its derivative is always zero. Now I'm saying these things are true for all x. So my interval is really the entire real number line, just to keep it as simple as possible here. Since this is a constant, you want to show it equals this constant, what would be good enough to do that? Um, to show it's any constant, to use the constant function theorem, I guess I'd have to show the derivative of this function, f of x squared plus g of x squared is always zero. I didn't say, by the way, that f and g are continuous and differentiable everywhere, but that's an implicit assumption because I'm writing the derivative symbols that implicitly assumes the derivatives exist and therefore these functions are differentiable. And if they're differentiable everywhere, we had a theorem back in chapter two that says, therefore they're continuous everywhere as well because discontinuities are also points of non-differentiability. Remember that? Long time ago, right? Let H of X be f of x quantity squared plus g of x quantity squared. Note, h is differentiable, I'll just abbreviate here, and continuous for all x since f and g are, that was an implicit assumption, and since h is a nice simple combination of f and g, where we're not dividing by zero anywhere. You can prove that if you square a continuous function and or differentiable function, you get a continuous or differentiable function. If you add two such functions, it'll still be continuous and differentiable. That can be proved. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into depth and in, into any detail other than to just say that. But effectively, this will be good, a good enough reason. Now differentiate H. How? I don't know what F and G are. Do an abstract differentiation. You've had homework problems like this. Differentiate it. Get H prime of X in terms of F and G and F prime and G prime. 
And you need the chain rule because like with f of x squared, the inner function is f of x and the outer function is the squaring function. You need the chain rule there as well. By the chain rule, h prime of x equals, careful, I got to use the chain rule. The derivative of x squared is 2x, right? But uh, that's not an x squared, it's an f of x squared. That's okay. Replace x with f of x. And for extra emphasis, I'll put a first power, though I don't have to, because right, raising to a first power doesn't change anything. Times with the extra step from the chain rule, the derivative of the inside function is f prime of x. It doesn't matter that I don't know what f and g are, even though I do, but we're pretending like we don't. Use the chain rule with the next one, 2g of x to the first power times g prime of x. Okay, so what? Anytime you do a proof in a math class, you need to use your assumptions in some way. Otherwise, why would you be assuming them? So we've got to use these things. Oh, okay. I, I guess I could replace f prime of x with g of x and g prime of x with negative f of x. Yeah, go ahead and do so. I'm assuming that's true. Replace f prime with g. Replace g prime with negative f of, f of x. Bring that negative sign in the second term to the front as a subtraction. Use the commutative property of multiplication to switch the f and the g around. And then we see we've got two things that are the same being subtracted. This is zero for all x. Therefore, by the constant function theorem, CFT stands for constant function theorem, H of X is a constant C for all X. That's what the constant function theorem allows us to conclude. If the derivative is always zero, the function's gotta be constant. Am I finished? Well, not quite. I'm, I'm trying to show this equals one. Since h of x is this, I've, I've shown this is constant, but why is the constant one? Well, it's because I haven't used, I haven't proved that yet because I haven't used these other assumptions here and here. Use those now. By assumption, f of zero is zero and g of zero is one. I guess I should have said by assumption back up here as well. So what does that mean? That means h of zero is f of zero squared plus g of zero squared. Zero squared plus one squared is zero plus one is one. But if h of x is constant for all x and h of zero is one, the constant's gotta be one, done. Therefore, f of x squared plus g of x squared equals h of x equals one for all x. Done, praise the Lord. What we're really learning here is how to structure an argument. I mean, yes, there's problem solving as well. You know, what in the world do we do? In this case, apply the constant function theorem. Well, what function do we apply to? That's a problem solving kind of thing to realize this is the, the thing you want to apply to because of what you want to show. Then how do you get there? How do you actually apply the constant function theorem? You have to verify that the hypotheses are satisfied first. And if that's true, and that's what I verified in saying H is differentiable and continuous everywhere and its derivative is always zero, then I can say, since I know the constant function theorem is true, that means h of x is a constant. It equals some constant for all x. And then I got to figure out what the constant is. So I put problems similar to this on exams. This exact problem has shown up in some exams in the past. I've modified it sometimes. 
it'd probably give you a little guidance. Like in this case, the guidance probably would be apply the constant function theorem to, to this function. And then you just have to know how to set it up, how to, how to say things in the right order. It's more important than you might realize. It does imply, it is essentially the case that these assumptions imply f of x does equal sine of x and g of x does equal cosine of x, though, though this thing that I just proved is not really a proof of that fact. That requires what's called existence and uniqueness theory of differential equations, but we're not doing that. 